A tale of a two-story house in Havana's historic district that collapsed and killed four people was featured on the first page of a Cuban newspaper lately. This is an uneasy expression of the physical conditions that many of the structures in Havana and the rest of the nation are suffering. Yet a large portion of the Cuban economy is also symbolized by it. Cuba's economy is in many respects a time capsule that could break even more. GDP growth maintained consistent growth between 1-2% to for the last decade until the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic hit. For many years, Cuba's centrally planned economy has been stuck in a rut, but the island's extremely fragile economy has been thrown into disarray over the last five years as the pillars supporting it have fallen one by one. First, the socialist government in Venezuela, which has bestowed cheap oil on Cuba, suffered a decline in oil output as a result of its poor management, which reduced Cuba's access to energy. Later, right-wing and conservative administrations took power throughout Latin America, led by Presidents Jair Bolsonaro of Brazil and Ivan Duque of Colombia, ending the exploitative agreements that allowed Cuba to send doctors abroad while keeping the majority of their salaries. Additionally, the Trump administration in the US severed long-lasting sanctions and stopped sending money to the island. The COVID-19 pandemic then broke out. The 2020 border blockade between Cuba and Venezuela severely damaged tourism and caused the second largest economic downturn in Latin America that year. However, as opposed to those around it in the Caribbean, Cuba never experienced a full recovery in tourism. The amount of tourists by October 2022 remain less than half of the quantity for the corresponding month in 2019. Actually, in 2021, roughly 357,000 international travelers visited Cuba, a decrease of almost 70% over 2020. This was the second year in a row with a steep drop in the number of visitors. It's the ban on their life. Additionally, even if Cuba changed its mind in 2021, and began to permit certain kinds of small enterprises, further market reforms have not advanced. One of the main causes of the hundreds of thousands of Cubans who have departed the island is economic instability. If you like this video so far, please consider liking and subscribing to the channel. Cuba's past is depressing. Six decades ago, it exchanged a conventional dictatorship for a communist dictatorship with predictable disastrous outcomes. Before the revolution that took place in 1953, it was among the richest nations of Latin America. As the time passed, it saw a significant decline until it became one of the lowest GDP per capita among other socialist countries. Its economic structure towards the end of the 1950s was characterized by significant technological backwardness and inadequate industrial development. Production and investment rates of expansion were modest, and there was a noticeable concentration in balance in the income distribution. The state was given a significant role in the creation of goods and services by economic policy, with a pronounced preference for planning over market processes in the control of business activity. Between 1959 and 1989, the product increased at an average annual rate of about 4%. Even though the economy's manufacturing bases saw significant shifts at this point in time, Several of the common flaws of the socialist nations persisted, including overly ambitious projects, the use of antiquated or obsolescent technologies, and a disregard for competitiveness. As a result, it missed out on the significant developments that were occurring in Western markets for 30 years. The nation enjoyed favorable trading conditions, guaranteed markets for its products, and ample funding for its balance of payments as a result of its agreements with the socialist nations. Drastic times, call for drastic measures, no? Cuba developed its capital goods stock, enlarged its physical infrastructure, boosted the capacity of its dams, updated its railway structure, and constructed expressways, highways, and rural roads, all despite glaring instances of inefficiency. The nation's electrification process advanced, and significant investments were made in the growth of human resources, particularly in the fields of sport, health, education, and culture. Significant progress in the population's access to fundamental services and the development of a more competent labor force have been rendered possible by the economic policy's high social dimension. The largest island in the Antilles, Cuba was the main exporter of sugarcane throughout the majority of the 19th and 20th centuries, which governed the nation's agro-industry. 
The primary agricultural economy there is the sugar industry. However, after the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, sugar production decreased. They couldn't make head or tail of it. Cuba thus began to represent the economic, social, political, and environmental effects of establishing a monoculture-based economy in order to serve other markets. This doesn't mean, nevertheless, that sugarcane constituted the only important crop cultivated in Cuban fields. A variety of plants were grown for both local and foreign markets, including rice, yucca, plantains, corn, sweet potatoes, and tobacco. There was also a long-standing, though not widely known, livestock custom. Despite the occasional unfavorable event that impacts consumers, the agro industry's supremacy nearly always outweighs agricultural and economic options that might evolve into prospective rivals. However, the production and export of sugar abruptly declined in the 1990s, leaving a void that allowed land usage to diversify and sparked the hunt for other agricultural approaches. Seems like Cuba's sugar industry has been ground into dust, no? Over a century of dominance, the greatest industry in Cuba was tourism in 1997, overtaking sugar. However, the 2001 terrorist attacks on September 11th in the United States caused additional issues for the sugar sector. In order to preserve foreign exchange, prices for items in Cuba were raised. Tourism earnings plummeted and Venezuela seized oil shipments to Cuba after it was unable to make repayments. Seems like they must jump through the hoops. In an effort to boost the efficiency of the sector, the government recommended the permanent shutdown of 71 of the 156 sugar mills in the nation due to economic difficulty. In 2005, 40 more mills were closed. Cuba had produced 1.5 to 2 million tons of sugar annually for the majority of the last 15 years, enough to meet domestic demand and enable the sale of raw sugar to China, the EU and the global market. But once more, the nation's reliance on tourism proved to be its downfall. The global COVID pandemic that began in 2020 caused a sharp decline in tourism, which severely damaged foreign exchange profits. Because of the scarcity of equipment, fuel, fertilizer, and other field inputs, the sugar industry is currently collapsing even more. For the first time in almost 200 years, the harvest of 2021 to 2022 was insufficient to meet Cuba's domestic sugar consumption needs. It appears possible that in 2023, Cuba won't export any sugar at all for the very first time since the early 1800s. There have been events in Cuban society since the 1990s that indicate a tendency towards a spike in the population facing the threat of poverty. Due to this, there is significant economic and opportunity disparity, as well as the exploitation of certain segments of society in the face of changes that don't impact the whole community. Raul Castro, the newly elected president recognized the rising inequality in the communist society and enacted reforms to enable the sale of laptops, DVD players, and cell phones, as well as to permit Cubans to stay in tourist hotels. Only Cubans with the hard currency, which is convertible pesos or CUCs, can pay for the goods and services. These CUCs are valued 24 times greater than the Cuban pesos, used for paying most wages. The majority of the goods and services were previously offered on the illicit market to people who were prepared to breach the law in order to purchase them and run the risk of having their goods seized. This draws attention to the disparities in a nation where the average monthly salary is only about $17. Professionals such as teachers and doctors have extremely modest state salaries, while Cubans who manage small enterprises, travel abroad on government missions, obtain CUC bonuses, receive remittances from relatives back home, or trade items on the black market have far more purchasing power. It's like Cuba was left in the lurch. By deregulating state-run businesses, the Cuban government has begun to stimulate the competitive performance of its economy in recent years. These regulations demonstrate the beginning of a robust industrial policy from the government, enabling medium-sized enterprises and cuenta propistas as entrepreneurs are known in Cuba, to function according to more expansive definitions of supply, demand, and capital reinvestment. It's worthy to mention that Cuba's exports saw a significant decline in recent years, so such government intervention might offset some of the negative repercussions of slowing exports. It's too soon to know how these rules will affect the home market demand or whether they will create fierce domestic competition. 
But it is anticipated that as Cuban earnings rise, the demand in the home market will grow and businesses will need to innovate more quickly. You can breathe a sigh of relief now. Given its geographic concentration and likelihood of intense domestic competition, market-related measures need to be implemented more quickly and be followed by long-term economic strategies that do not benefit any specific businesses or sectors in the economy. The implementation of market efficiencies would be hindered by government protection or engagement, impacting the acquisition of skills and developments and preventing the development of a competitive advantage for Cuba. Any sustainable strategy should also seek long-term rewards for investment and capital returns to further improve infrastructure, technology and human capabilities rather than only meeting short-term cash flow projections. This will therefore make it possible for businesses to create long-term investment plans that will outlast economic measures. We can see the light at the end of the tunnel now, right? Finally, it is debatable whether currency controls would help a nation emerging from its frozen past tip the scales in its favour when it begins to compete globally. Long-term economic development on the island will be hampered by the dual currency system and the existing peg of the Cuban convertible peso to the US dollar. Companies and the government there would get obsessed with financial flows at the expense of potential energy from benefits or drawbacks to the economy. There are hints of a new threat in the Caribbean. Generations after the military and political impasse, additional economic measures have been implemented since the 2008 handoff between the Castro brothers, giving Cuba a further boost to become a global economic force. Greater motivation has been made possible by the progress made by the US, EU and Cuban relations. Such a bittersweet relationship. In fact, Cuba could increase its national competitiveness through its drawbacks, population and possible future foreign direct investment, which would undermine the regional economic growth of nations like Costa Rica, the Dominican Republic and Mexico, nations that share trade connections and economic shocks. Thanks for watching till the end. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to hit the like and subscribe buttons to receive more content. See you in the next video.